Amen. Thank you, Steve, for the song. And uh, this is Advent. Advent is upon us. Uh, last week we began Advent and we, we lit the candle of hope. And let me, let me just say as we walk away over here to light the candle of hope, the, the, the candles are moved because we're going to have the Youth Drama Club um, help us with the service a little later. The, the candle of hope we lit, and, and, and last week what we talked about is that darkness sets the stage for hope. Church, in your, in your lives, you live in this world where darkness has been against us since the beginning of time. We, we remember back in, in Genesis the way the devil uh, tricked Adam and Eve and, and, and caused sin. And from, from that time on, people had this hope for a savior, hope because of the darkness in the world and, and hope because of the personal darkness in each of our lives. Moving forward this week, we go from, from the candle of hope to the candle of love. And I want you to understand today that as we as we light the candle of love, that what we're doing is we're remembering God's love for us. You see, the, the candle of hope and the candle of love, they, they go hand in hand. And as we count the, light the candle of hope or love, what we remember is that the candle of hope is lit because we have hope in the midst of darkness, but we experience God's love that gives us salvation. I understand this morning, church, that if it was just this hope that I possessed... I never can achieve that salvation that's at the end of the line, but when God's love is brought into the mix, this love where God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life, that love propels us to victory in Christ. This, this love spoken about in, in Ephesians chapter 1, that he chose us and him before the foundation of the world. Remember God's love, that we, should, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Christ Jesus, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. Understand that God, this love of God was not some second plan. It wasn't plan B. It wasn't some, uh, something that just happened when sin entered in the world. But this was God's plan from the beginning. This morning, our, our text we read, and, and, and even as we begin our, our service this morning, we're going to focus in Jeremiah 33, that the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise, the good promise I made to the people of Israel and Judah. Understand, friends, that this love of God, this is a love from before the foundation of the earth, a love that is famously spread by Jeremiah to the ends of the earth. And we, church, continue to spread the love of God for the glory of Jesus Christ. Amen. This morning, please join your hearts with mine as we prepare for the Lord's word. Father God, we thank you for Jesus. God, we thank you for the salvation that we share in him. God, we pray that uh, Lord, as we open our hearts, that you would just send your spirit to direct us, to, to strengthen us, Father, to teach us. God, help us to see your love in Jeremiah 33. God, help us to see your love in our lives today during this hectic Christmas holiday, Father. We thank you, God, for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Today in Jeremiah 33, we're going to see the love of God as we continue as we continue our time in Advent. The, the text reads like this, Jeremiah 33, 14 and following. God's word. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will dwell securely. And this is the name by which it will be called, the Lord is our righteousness. Amen and amen. May the Lord add to the blessing of the reading of his word. This morning, friend, I want you to understand that God's salvation plan is revealed in the Old Testament. I, I think we see a glimmer of it in Genesis, but as, as, as things play out in the Old Testament, we, we see passages like this in, in Jeremiah. And what it should remind us is that we, as God's people, we, we hope for salvation. And, 
And let me just say this. If you're here this morning and you're not saved, if you don't, you don't have this hope in your life, understand that in Christ you can have hope for a future salvation because Jesus Christ came and he died on the cross for you. But never forget that God provides salvation because of his love. In other words, this morning as you sit there and you think, I, I hope for a coming Christ. Last week as we participated in the Lord's Supper, we remember that it's not just the death and the burial, it's not just the body and the blood that was poured out that we remember, but we also look forward to that time when Jesus Christ comes back to earth. Right when, when, when the Lord returns and he gathers for himself his own people, that, that we would be taken up with Christ. And we'd have no more tears, no more suffering, no more pain, no more angst in our lives. That's the day that we hope for, but God provides that because he loves you. Today, church, as we focus on God's love and we just, we just think, God, look, this is such a crazy time of year. And some of you I know, if you've lost a loved one, the holidays are, are difficult. Right? Remember that God's love gets you through. Remember that when you're in this frantic, hectic stuff of the world and, and buying gifts, that, that God's love is what gets you through. God's love guarantees success through all of this junk that happens in our lives. As last week we talked about darkness setting the background for hope today. Today, understand that sin, rebellion, defiance sets the stage for love. I, I have five kids. You, you guys know that mostly. Five boys. That's harder than just five kids. <laughs> and every one of them is probably too much like me. And the little face on the girl where she's pulling out her hair and sticking out her tongue and closing her eyes and like maybe plugging her ears off. Oh, oh, oh. The only person that can love that little girl is a parent. <laughs> that's like a picture of me and you before God do you get this that, that when God looks at us in our fallen state before Christ just, just like Israel and if you look at the passage in Jeremiah 33 that, 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 that the background of that passage is this rebellion of Israel it's this, this, this defiance where God has said to Israel this is the path I want you to take in life. This is what I want you to do. This is where I want you to go, where I want you to settle. This is how I want you to worship. And, and I only want you to worship me. And Israel goes like this to God. La, 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 I'm not hearing you. And, and this morning, it's not much different for you and for me. Right? That, that, that me before Christ... I was that God, that, that, that guy that was looking at God and essentially plugging my ears, sticking out my tongue, screaming, pulling on my hair, saying, I'm not going to do it your way. God, I'm going to do it my way. It is in that context. Listen, it's in that context that, that we see God's love for people. The Jews, they forsake the laws of God. They rebel against God when he saves them out of Egypt. They, instead of worshiping Christ or God, they worship Baal. They turn their backs on the one true God who brought them out of Egypt and all of this stuff. And God still loves them. This morning, if you don't get anything else, get this, that it's, it's not because of you that God loves you. It's because of God that God loves you. Because if it was because of me that God had to love me, I would fail and if it was because of you that God had to love you, you would fail. Understand in, in your life that the defiance, the rebellion, the sin causes pain and ser servitude. That the, the, the pain and, and the suffering is, is often caused by, by sin in our lives. I, I've counseled many people with the word of God. And, and I can tell you that, that when you live outside of God's will, it hurts. And, and it causes pain. I, I could tell you, the husband, that, that you should be faithful to your wife, right? And, and I can tell you that if you're not faithful, if, if you practice infidelity, you're having an affair, it's going to hurt. It's going to cause pain in your life. I, I, I could tell you, children, that obey your father and mother, that your days might be long upon the land, the fifth commandment, you know, with the promise, right? Do that, and, and you'll have success in life. But if you don't, it's going to hurt. That This is what Israel experienced the, the, the pain and suffering that comes from uh, going against God. If, if you're in Jeremiah, you could go to the next book, Lamentations, and, and you start to hear the voice of the, the weeping prophet, as he's called. In, in, in Lamentations chapter 1, the first couple of verses, Jeremiah writes this. You can, 
You can hear the emotion in the prophet's voice as he cries out, how lonely sits the city that was full of people. How like a widow has she become, she who is great among the nations, she who had princes among the provinces has become a slave. She weeps bitterly in the night with tears on her cheeks. Among all her lovers, she has none to comfort her. All her friends have dwelt treacherously with her. They have become her enemies. Do you see, do you see what's going on here? What, what, what Jeremiah is doing is he's saying that in all of her lovers, she has no one to comfort her. He's making this relationship that we often see in the Old Testament between adultery and idolatry. Listen, adultery and idolatry are, are hand in hand in the Old Testament. And God often uses that metaphor. Christian, when you worship another God, it's like committing the sin of adultery against the one true God that loves you and gave himself for you. And it causes pain in your life. You even notice that in Lamentations 1, he, he relates this pain to this servitude, this, this slavehood. And let me, let me say to you that, that people, people often... They, they sin because they, they think that the sin gives them power, right? They, they think that, that the sin is good, that I, I, can, I can do it. I can have a wife and a mistress. Check me out. It doesn't really work that way. It enslaves you. Where the sin is, it, it is like the, the, the venom on Spider-Man or something where it's just, it's, it's all encompassing and, and, and you feel empowered at first, but pretty soon you want to get rid of it, but you can't. Too many people have I spoken with or prayed with or counseled with. And I, I know it's not just me, pastors and people and brothers and sisters and friends. You've met that person that says, friend, I'm struggling with the sin in my life and I can't get rid of it. I've got this addiction. I've got this something. I want to rip it off, but I can't. And it leaves you like Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, longing for salvation. If you ever watch the, the Spider-Man where Venom is there, what you start to see is that he begins and he's like, I am more powerful doing it my way. I have more strength. I've got more energy. It's, it's all about me and what I can do. And pretty soon he's like, please, somebody help me release myself. Help me get out of this. It's addiction. It's the addiction that we have to pride or, or the addiction that we have to, 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 to sexual immorality or the addiction that we have to money or to drugs. And, and let, me, let me just pause and say that some of the addictions that we have are in and of themselves good things, right? God created sex to be a good thing, to be shared between a husband and a wife, and that it should be glorious and amazing. The whole book, Song of Songs, right? That, that book should be worn out in your Bibles, husband. <laughs> God did that for us, and we should praise him for it. But when we pervert it, it hurts us. And we think that we're getting more, but we're getting less. And it leaves us longing for the salvation only God can give. And what always strikes me about this longing is that we're tempted to seek satisfaction in the world. Do you know, do you know that uh, Christmas time, we spend so much money. We spend so much money in Christmas time on, on Christmas gifts. And, and it's almost like we're trying to buy happiness. And don't, 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 don't misunderstand. Listen, I... I fully believe that it's good to give gifts to people and that our love language is to be giving and receiving. And man, praise God that we live in a place we're able to celebrate in that way. But, but $650 billion was spent on Christmas last year. That's like a thousand bucks per person, say the researchers. And for some people, this is the saddest time of year ever. Right, that the world tries to trick us into seeking the world for, 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 for satisfaction. The world offers this fake relief. This is the way, way it works often in your life is, is you'll be struggling with a sin. And the world holds this out to you. They say, hey, hey, take, take this. Take this apple from me. Take this, this fruit from me. It's going to be good for you. It's going to give you relief. But you know what happens in your life if you take that forbidden fruit? It's going to offer you this temporary satisfaction that's going to fade quickly. Money's a good example. You know the new car feeling? Researchers say it lasts about seven months. And then we're ready for a, another one. Another shot in the arm. 
It's the same thing that, that happens with all other addictions. Um, uh, the sexual affairs don't often satisfy that longing that we have because God made that longing for our spouse, the, the one that can satisfy us. The world offers fake relief. The devil's trickery. Check out what the devil does in Gen Genesis chapter 3. I, I want you to see this because it hasn't changed. Y'all, this is the same thing that happens to us today. The devil tries to make sin look tasty. And if you read through all of the, 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 the account in Genesis chapter 3, what you start to see is that the devil is taking God's word and twisting it. You ever hear a, a guy say, well, I'm just looking like that's okay. Right? It's a twisting of God's word. Or, or if you read through it, the Pharisees argue with Jesus. What they do is they, they twist God's word. This is what the devil has done. And, and, and in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 6, it all kind of comes to a head. And it says that the woman saw that the tree was good for food. She's completely bought into the devil's lie. She, uh, that it was a delight to the eyes. You see what's happening in the woman's heart. And listen, Adam wasn't far away. She handed him the fruit. So they're like maybe side by side. And she's like, wow, that looks like it'll be good for me. That is such a delight to my eyes. It's going to be amazing. If I could just get this fruit, I'm going to have all of my needs met. And I'm going to be so much happier than I could ever be without that fruit. And not only that, but it's desired to make one wise. You get this, this sensation that she is desiring this fruit and one guy, he said it like this, it, it, it starts with comparing, right? God, God had given him the fruit. God said, check out all of this stuff that I've given to you all to eat. And they see all of it and they're like, but there's this one thing that I'm not supposed to do and that's what I really want. <laughs> Remember kids, you can tell your kids, you can play in any place in the entire house except this one place. Where are they going to play? Right there where they're not supposed to play. That's, that's us. Right? We don't change, we just get bigger. Once we, once we start comparing and we start to see that what I don't have is better than what I do have, we start competing to get it. And we start like desiring, it's this, this, this I'm going to do whatever it takes to, 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 to get that one thing that I can't have. And then we compromise. She took the fruit and she ate. And she gave it to her husband, Adam, who was with her, and he ate also that fruit. And then sin happens. And you know what happens whenever they sin? They don't find satisfaction. Can I tell you, if you don't uh, hear anything else again, this is the second time if you don't hear anything else, understand sin won't satisfy you. If you sin to find satisfaction, if you rebel against God, if you defy God's command, it's not going to last. You know what does last? God's unconditional love. Listen, the devil offers you this fake, this fake Satisfaction, God offers love unconditional. And I want you to notice in the text in Jeremiah 33, what we, what we start to see happen is God is using these words and, and they're, 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 they're words that emphasize God's position in offering love. He says, I will fulfill the promise that I made. As he continues, he says in verse 15, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up. And what God is doing over and over is he's saying, I am going to cause your salvation. I'm going to bring Jesus Christ that I knew from the beginning of the foundations of the earth that he would come and he would die on that old rugged cross that you might be offered salvation, freedom from that sin that is crushing upon you. You can go back to Deuteronomy chapter 7. I love that passage because in verses 6 through 10, what, what God does is he talks about Israel and he, he says it like this. You're a people holy for the Lord your God. And then in, in verse 6, he says, you're a treasured possession. Verse 7, he says, it was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you. For you were the fewest of all people, but it is because the Lord loves you. Do you hear what God is saying to Israel as he looks at them after the exodus? And he's like, you know why I loved you? It wasn't because of you. <laughs> it's not because you were bigger. It's not because you were stronger. It's not because you were healthier. It's not because you were smarter. It's not because you were more successful. I loved you because I love you. I love you because of me, not because of you. It is God and his love unconditional that allows us freedom and a we can move forward to the New Testament. 
In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 through 6 that I read as we lit the candle, what we, what we saw is that God, from before the foundation of the earth, set his love on you. Do you understand that the, the passage in Ephesians 1, the passage in Deuteronomy, what we're learning from God is that God loves you because God loves you, not because of who you are but because of who he is and in Christ and that blood that flowed down from the cross, Jesus gave everything because God loves you that he could free you with this, not trickery, but this unconditional kind of love. Let me, let me just take a moment to shamelessly plug missions. Do you know that, that giving to missions allows you to vicariously offer relief to these people that are struggling, struggling across the world? You know what, what, why, why I rejoice so much in seeing every one of these little flags. Remember, each one, $500 given to missions, 100% goes to missions. It's because what this means is that you guys are giving the gospel to somebody in the furthest, outermost parts of the world that otherwise would not hear it. Do you know, I, I can't go to all of those places even if I spent the rest of my life traveling year by year to a different country. I would never see all the people. If all of us did all of that, we still would never see all the people that need to hear the gospel. The only way it ever works is if we cooperate together with all of these other like 47,000 Southern Baptist churches, all supporting missionaries together. The missionaries raise up pastors that plant churches that reach the people so that we see like 1.9 million gospel conversations. 175,000 people led to Christ last year. I didn't talk to that many people last year. Have you experienced the freedom that Christ gives you? Give to missions that somebody else might also experience that freedom. Understand then in Jeremiah 33 that love comes in God's perfect timing. Love comes in God's perfect timing. And I like, I like the way that, that it's written in, in all of verses 14, 15, and 16. But what we, what we see is that God says, behold, the days are coming. Verse 15, those days, that time he goes on in verse 16, in those days, and Judah will be saved. What, what God is doing is he's saying, y'all, I've got this figured out. And, and, and let me just, let me tell you that, that sometimes when, when we're waiting, it's not that easy. But right? you ever have that time in your life where God is saying, wait. And I don't know about you guys, but I don't wait very well even when I know that God is in control, sometimes I have to remind myself that, that God does God's things in God's time, not in, not in mine. Two important truths we got to know. It's, it's not always for you to know the times that God has set. This is from Acts chapter 1 and verse 7 where they're waiting for the Spirit and they're like, God, now? When's it going to happen? Are you, are you coming back? We see this throughout the Bible. They say, Jesus, when, when are you going to come back and get us? And he's like, well, hold on there. It's not for you to know. In your life, when you're at that place where you're sitting there and you're thinking, God, come on. God, when's it going to happen? God, God, come on. Just, Lord, hurry. God, come on. It's not always for you to know the time. It's not always for me to know the time. It's not, not always easy, but not always for me to know that Time second, understand this truth about God's timing. God's patience reflects God's love for the world. Do you understand that as we talked this morning about the love that God had, the love that God showed you, Christian, the love that God has offered to you, if you don't believe this morning, God has said, I sent my son Jesus to die for you, live for me, receive that salvation. If, if Christ came back today, do you know how many people would go to a devil's hell? Lots of them. You, you know that, that God's patience reflects God's love. It, it's, not that, it's not that God is just prolonging salvation for, for nonsensical reasons. It's not that, that God is just up there like a tyrant in the sky just toying with different people, but it's, it's God saying like, like 2 Peter 3, 8, 9, a thousand years is like a day and a day is like a thousand years. And then he goes on in verse 9 and he says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some might count slackness, but he's long suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. 
As much as we're torn to say, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Also, God, wait that one more guy, my uncle or my cousin or my friend, might come to know you. Trust God's perfect timing and God will always make it right for you. And then third, we see this. Love makes Christ our righteousness. The, the, the last, like one, two, three, four, five words. The Lord is our righteousness. This, this is where it like all comes together. The Lord Jesus Christ is our righteousness. Jesus is our righteousness. Check this out. Second Corinthians. You can write this down or you can go read through the passage. Second Corinthians chapter 5 verses 20 and 21, especially verse 21. Where Paul writes and he says, we are ambassadors, therefore, for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Do you hear what Paul is saying? He's saying, I am begging you, be reconciled to God. And he goes on in verse 21. Listen to what he says. Because for our sake, he made him, he made Christ to be sin, who knew no sin, that in him, that is in Christ, we might become the righteousness of God. Do you understand what Paul is saying is happening is that the Lord is my righteousness. You really want it to be impactful, personalize it. For Steve's sake, for my sake, God made Christ to be sin who knew no sin, that in Christ, Steve might become the righteousness of God. Do you see this? I, I can be the righteousness of God because of the blood of Christ that was transferred to me. In other words, when, when God looks at Jesus Christ, he saw the sin of Pastor Steve. When God looks at Pastor Steve, he sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ that gave everything for me, for you. That's why Paul says, we beseech you, therefore, we implore you, we beg you as ambassadors of Christ, be reconciled to God. Don't leave here today if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior because tomorrow's a day not promised. I've seen too many people die before they were supposed to die to tell you that it's okay to get right with Jesus tomorrow. It's not. Get right with Jesus today. Christ, Christ is our righteousness and Christ's love is what propels it. Listen, listen, church, there's three truths about God's love for those who count Christ as a righteousness. You are God's treasured possession. So, so many times in this kind of a holiday, we, we struggle with inadequacy. I read the statistic where like $1,000 a person is spent on Christmas. Somebody might be out there and they're watching the world tell you, bye, 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 bye. Spin, 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 spin. And you're sitting there and you're thinking, I don't have that much money to spend and you feel inadequate. Or your kids want something that you can't afford. Or, or maybe just all of the holiday stuff and you don't feel like you're good enough. You're God's treasured possession. Do you get that out of all of the animals and all of the world and all of creation, out of all of the stuff? God said, you know what I want? I want that raggedy old sinner, Pastor Steve, as my tre treasured possession. I want that guy or that girl that doesn't really deserve my love. That's the one I want, and I'm going to make him or her amazing. Next thing about God's love, remember this, relax. It's not because of you. Do, do you get that? It's not because of what you've done or what you're going to do that God has set his love on you. It's because of God. God loves you the way God made you, and God wants you that way. There, in this, this holiday time, as we sometimes get down about our lives because we're feeling inadequate, something that's good to remember is that God loves what you're looking at. You get, Here, try this with me. Look at the person next to you and just say this. God loves what you're looking at. Here, look, look at the person next to you. We're going to try this. It's group exercise. Now, all together, God loves what you're looking at. You guys, you've got more attitude than that. I've talked to you in person. <laughs> you look at the person next to you. God loves what you're looking at. <laughs> and believe it because he does and he created you that way because he loves you. And then remember the third point about God's love. It never, ever fails. God's love will see you through to the end. Through all the difficulties. That's what happened for Joseph and Mary as we go to the New Testament. We look at the birth story of Jesus Christ. Love is born. And we find in Luke chapter 2 that, that 
that the, 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 the time to give birth happened and, and, and Jesus is born and there was no room for them at the end. So they're in a stable and the angel appeared to the shepherds in the field. And it says, verse 10, fear not. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Church, Jesus came down to be with us. Now, I, let me just tell you as I come back to the candles, the world's going to try to snuff out the lights of love and hope. Right? You, this is... The candle of hope and the world's going to say, you, you, don't, you don't have hope. I'm going to take that away. The world says, you don't deserve the love of God. I'm going to take that away. When, when, when life gets you down this season, turn to Jesus for help because he wants to give it to you. Mm -hmm.